the title of the message today is Destined to Follow. Destined to Follow. And we want to look at the life of Ruth today. We want to look at the life of Ruth. Only two books in the Bible that are named after women. One was Esther. We looked at that. And the other one is Ruth. And so we want to look at the life of Ruth today. Would you please say out loud, Destined to Follow. Destined to follow. I want to begin by looking at Ruth chapter 1 and the first five verses, and then I'm going to attempt to just summarize her life and pull out some principles. It says this in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1, in the days when the judges ruled. In fact, many biblical scholars feel that this parallels during the time of Gideon. Uh, when it talks about Moab and it talks about Midian, Midianites were oftentimes Bedouin uh, nomads that would migrate and move to different spots. But many scholars feel that this was around the time that, that it took place. And so in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, Moab was actually right on the other side of the Dead Sea. And so for people to get to Moab, they would have had to go up around the Dead Sea and into the country of Moab. Verse 2, the man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephraphites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Now, I want us to think about the context of this precious woman, Naomi. Here, she's living with her husband. She's got two sons and famine hits the land. It must have been extremely severe, so severe that they felt like they had to go to Moab in order to survive. And so they go to Moab. The Bible tells us here that they, they lived about, uh, they were there for about 10 years. And then Elimelech, her husband, dies. And then her two uh, sons actually married Moabite women. But then the two sons died as well. So think about this. Naomi uh, is a widow and she's living with her two daughters-in-law who are now also uh, widows. And so we want to look at the life uh, of, of Ruth here, who was Naomi's daughter-in-law. And Naomi was an extraordinary woman, uh, and so was Ruth. We're going to find that Ruth is really an incredible story of loyalty and love. And so there's much for us to, to draw from, uh, from the events that took place. So here Naomi is as a widow, her two daughter-in-laws as widow. And finally, Naomi uh, feels like she might as well go back to Bethlehem. She heard that uh, the famine was coming to an end, and now she has nothing to keep her in Moab. And so she tells her two daughter-in-laws that she's going to go back, and, and they weep together and they cry. And she tells Ruth and, and Orpah, she says, you should, you should just stay here with your families. And at first, both of them uh, really don't want that. They want to take care of Naomi. They want to go with her. Uh, finally, Orpah receives, and she says, yeah, I'll go back to, to my family. But Naomi, uh, she, I mean, Ruth really feels in her heart that she's supposed to, to go with Naomi. And so they go back to, to Bethlehem. Uh, and so the, the town of Bethlehem is amazed. They're rejoicing that Naomi is back into town. They all, they all remember her. Uh, but you can imagine, as widows, they just didn't have much provision. And so uh, today, uh, if somebody's left as a widow, it might be really, really difficult. Multiply that by hundreds and hundreds, and you might get a little bit of the context of how difficult it would have been uh, back then. And so they got there right around the time of harvest, and so Naomi had an idea. She said, why don't Ruth, why don't you go where the harvest is and you can follow the people that are harvesting and a lot of times there's leftovers. You can, uh, you can pick up the leftover grains. And so that's what she did. She followed the harvesters. Well, she just happened to go to a field that was owned by a gentleman by the name of, of Boaz. And so she was working hard and she was 
uh, picking up the leftover grains. And Boaz asks the other people, says, who, who is that? And they said, oh, that's Ruth. That's uh, Naomi's daughter-in-law. And he says, well, you make sure that you take care of her. You make sure that you protect her. Uh, and so uh, he even offered her a meal that day. And so she went home and had all this grain. And Naomi was amazed that uh, she had all, all this food. She asked, well, where did you go? She goes, oh, I went to a man uh, named Boaz, his field. And she goes, oh, he's actually uh, one of our relatives. Uh, in fact, he's what we call our kinsman redeemer. And so uh, she told her, keep going to, to Boaz's field. And so she did that. Well, after some time, we don't know everything that took place, but there must have been some interest. Now, there's two things about the culture here uh, that are really important. The first one is this idea of a kinsman redeemer. Uh, it's a little confusing for us as, as 21st century people, uh, but typically when somebody would die uh, or they would uh, have property that was left over, the, the closest relative was able to, to buy that piece of property. But if there was a widow, he was supposed to marry that widow. Uh, and, and so uh, Naomi had in her heart, we should maybe pursue Boaz to see if he will buy the property that we had, they actually had a piece of land that Elimelech still had, and she was going to sell that in order to get provision. And so she said, I want you to go to Boaz. But, uh, and during the harvest, they would all work together. And sometimes the harvest was so uh, plentiful and it was such hard work that they would all sleep the night in the fields. And so she said to Ruth, she said, go at night and go and sleep at the foot of Boaz. Now, that was really important because culturally, if she would have slept next to him, that would have been very, very inappropriate. And so she said, sleep down at his feet, uh, perpendicular to him, and then lift up his blanket so that his feet are exposed. And, and what that'll do is wake him up, and then you do what, whatever he tells you to do. And so that's what happened. Boaz ate, and he went to sleep that night, and he's got a blanket on, and and Ruth lays down perpendicular at his feet so that it wouldn't look inappropriate or anything like that. But she lifts up his garment, lifts up uh, his, 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 uh, his blanket, and his feet are exposed. And that wakes him up. And he looks and he's shocked that there's, a, that there's a woman there. He didn't want anything to be inappropriate. He says, who are you? And she goes, well, I'm Ruth. I'm, I'm Naomi's uh, daughter-in-law. And then Boaz pays her a great compliment. We'll look at this verse in a moment. Uh, but he says, you're a woman of character. The whole town knows that you're a, you're a woman of character. And so then he begins to pursue uh, getting the land. And so uh, he knows in his heart that if he gets the land, that then Ruth is an eligible person for him to marry. But he's got to go to the closest relative. And so the Bible says that they go, and they, he calls all the elders of the town, and uh, he mentions to the relative that's closest, he says, hey, Naomi, has a piece of land. Elimelech had a piece of land, and he wants that she wants to sell it. And he says, "Oh, I'll buy it." And then he tells him, "But he's got a there's a woman that's involved." And that man says, "Well, no, I don't want to marry her. I'm married. I've got my children." And so that opens the door for Boaz. And so Boaz pursues. He buys the land, and then he marries Ruth. And so it's a remarkable story. The end of the book finishes by saying that Ruth and Boaz have a baby, and she ends up being the great-grandmother of, of King David. What's really interesting is she actually makes it into the de genealogy of Christ. In fact, most ancient, and ladies, we don't want your feelings to be hurt here, but you have to realize it was a different time, a different place. But most ancient gene genealogies would exclude women. They wouldn't even put women in. So it was remarkable that Matthew put uh, four women in the genealogy of Jesus. And you know who they were? Uh, they were? They were Esther, they were Tamar, they were Rahab, and it was Ruth. All four of them were Gentiles. All four of them uh, had troubles. A few of them had real uh, problems in their life. But that's just like the Lord saying, you know what? Uh, everybody is a part of the kingdom of God. And if you have a messy past, God makes it a message. Can you say amen? So I want you to say this. Say destined to follow, destined to follow. 
So I want to pull out some, some things uh, about this story that we can, that we can draw from. Uh, the first one is, is to be loyal, is to be loyal. And the key is all about relationships. Now, here's what you've got to decide is you have to discern who to let go and who to hold on to. Okay, so listen to Ruth chapter 1 and verses 16 to 18. And, and this is when Naomi's trying to convince them to stay in their country, to stay with their parents. And Naomi responds, or Ruth responds to Naomi, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you will go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the first thing is, Naomi, I keep saying Naomi, Ruth, Ruth was incredibly loyal. And she was loyal to, Na to, to Naomi. There was a close relationship here between Naomi and, and Ruth. And, and so the key is relationships. Now, in that, what you and I have to discern is who to let go and who to hold on to. Now, the other daughter-in-law felt like she was to go back to her, to her parents, and, and there was nothing wrong with that. But for whatever reason, Ruth felt like she was supposed to be uh, connected to Naomi. Now, when it comes to relationships, there are some relationships that you just have to let go of. Now, for me, that's really hard because I'm, I'm a loyal guy. I am very loyal. I, 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 it just happens to be who I am. So if I have a friend, I'm committed to them. But, you know, there are some relationships that you, you just have to, to let go of. I know there, there are, every one of us here probably have some tension in some relationships. And you do what you can to, to repair. You do what you can to ask forgiveness. You do what you can to ask God's healing. But there are some things, let's be honest, that are, that are quite irreparable. And you have to roll that over onto the Lord. You have to give it to the Lord and say, I can't fix this situation. I'm just going to have to let go of, of that situation. That's not easy to do. But there are some relationships that, that you just have to let go. In fact, if, if you hold on to them too long, they're, they're going to keep you down. They might, they might be really discouraging for you, or they might keep you from loving the Lord, serving the Lord. Uh, quite honestly, some of you might be holding on to relationships that are not godly. They, they're, they're keeping you down. You have got to give those relationships to the Lord if you want to continue to grow in the Lord, if you want the peace of the Lord, if you want the joy of the Lord in your life. It, it's pretty obvious when somebody doesn't know the Lord. It's more complicated when both parties know the Lord, but even then it's not always reconcilable. And you just got to give it to the Lord for your own peace and joy and for their own peace and, the, and joy. Let me say this as a footnote. Thank God for heaven, because when we get to heaven, we won't have all of our stuff and all of our junk, and we'll be able to have relationships that are whole, and some of those things will be healed. I've come to the conclusion at this stage in my life that I can't fix or repair everything. I would like to, but I've had to say, you know what? Some things are just going to be repaired in heaven. But that's actually become a peace and comfort for me. So, so you have to say, okay, what relationships do, do I let go of? And then there are other relationships that you got to hold on to, that you got to be committed to, that you have to say, yeah, I'm going I'm to hold on. This was Ruth. She said, I'm committed to this relationship, and, and, and I'm going to be there for you through difficult times and through, through heartache and through, through trials. I, I, I'm with you. I'm going to cry with you. I'm going to weep with you. I'm going to work for you. I'm going to provide for you. you got to discern there are some that you just, you just got to hold on to. Now, your first relationship is that of the Lord. You've got to hold on to the Lord. Now, I want you to listen to James 4, verse 8. Now, I've chosen this out of the New Living Translation. But I want you to really see this. He says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty. Would you please say loyalty? For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. There are some people that their loyalty is divided between the Lord and the world. You may have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. 
I'm not saying this to hurt your feelings or to be unkind to you. Uh, I know it might even make some of you angry with me. But you've got to make a decision. Are you going to be loyal to the Lord? Because if you're living a life that's divided and you, you don't have singular focus on the kingdom of God, it will tear you up. You're not going to succeed in life. And sometimes people wonder why is... Why are they having so many trials in their life? Why, why are things just not going? It could be that of surrender. You're just not loyal to the Lord. You're divided. You love the world as much as you love the Lord. And you've got to make a quality, strong decision to say, you know what, I'm going to love the Lord with all of my heart. Uh, that's the relationship I am going to hold on to. Some of you might just be holding on to the world a little too much. And you've got to let go of that. God's looking for people that are completely abandoned and surrendered to him and loyal to him. The NIV uses the word singular. That you're not double-minded, you're singular in your focus. The NLT says, says you're loyal. And so our first relationship is, is I going to be loyal, so loyal uh, to the Lord? Uh, but listen to Luke chapter 9 and verses 23 to 24. This is... Jesus talking. And then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Verses 25 to 26. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man or the son of God, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. My brother and sister, you don't want to be ashamed of the Lord. Some of you, again, I'm not trying to be mean or unkind, but some of you might be a little too concerned about what other people think. You should be more concerned about what the Lord thinks. Say amen to that. And the Bible's really clear here. Jesus doesn't mince words. He, I try to package things. Jesus just said it the way it was. He said, if you're embarrassed about me here on earth, when it comes to the judgment day, I'm going to be embarrassed for you. I'm, I'm not going to be proud of you. I'm going to be ashamed of you. So make a decision to follow the Lord with all that you have got. Don't hold back. Hold on to the Lord. Let go of some stuff uh, in the world. Now, some relationships you, you hold on to. And so the first key is that of loyalty. Would you say loyalty? So the key is relationships. Your relationship with the Lord, your relationships with other people. Discern, discern who to let go and who to hold on to. Now, the second uh, ingredient, the second principle that I want to pull out of Ruth's life is that you got to keep up your hope. Naomi and Ruth kept up their hope. You can imagine they had no financial provision. They were probably lonely. They wondered how in the world they were going to make it. Now, the key to keep up your hope is that of comfort. And here's what you got to hold on to. God has not forgotten you. And so you might be here today and, and you might have lost a loved one. We have some people that have lost their husbands or lost their wives. Or you might have lost a, a, a parent, a, a child. A child is never supposed to die before their parents. You might have lost someone today. Um, let's put it this way. Let's add to this, not just widows and widowers, uh, but let's say you, you went through the loss of a marriage and you have grieved over that. Uh, let's say that you've lost other things. Uh, what you need to receive is God's comfort. And you've got to get a hold of this principle that God has not forgotten you. You've got to keep telling yourself over and over and over, even if your feelings are raging against you, the truth is the Lord hasn't forgotten you. Say amen to that. Now, in, in, in Ruth chapter 1 and verses 19 to 21, we get some insight. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Because of the Almighty has made my life very bitter. She's referring to the waters at Mara when the Israelites uh, were drinking water in the desert and it was bitter. 
I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Now, her statements are understandable. She went to another country, but her husband died. She went to another country. She gained two daughters-in-law. I'm sure that was joyful, but then her two sons died. So so she goes uh, in order for provision, and yet comes back in in terrible heartache. She she has lost everything, so much so that when they celebrate, say, oh, Naomi, she says, no, don't even call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because I've got a bitter taste in my mouth. Now, listen, it's, it's understandable if you have a bitter taste in your mouth. We all get bitter. You go through a painful circumstance. Let's say you had a marriage that broke up. I'm sure there's a a, a bitter taste in your mouth when it comes to relationships. Uh, If your spouse died, your husband or your wife died, I'm sure there's a bitter taste in your mouth, even even maybe toward the Lord. Why did they have to die so soon? Why why weren't they here uh, for me? Uh, That's normal. Don't, don't miss this word bitterness. Bitter, we can all become bitter. Maybe you had a financial investment that, went, that just went down the tubes. Maybe you tried to start a business and it, and it, and it never succeeded. Maybe you had a house and, and you couldn't pay the mortgage. Bitterness, bitterness. But there's a reason, there's a correlation when the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because we've all had bitterness. But you got to make a shift and say, Lord, you're still good. I'm tasting of the Lord. The Lord is good. He heals. He restores. He, he provides. The key is you got to say to yourself over and over and over again, God has not forgotten me. Even if I've gone through a valley, even if I'm hurting, even if, even if my mouth is full of bitterness, my heart is full of bitterness, because it's, it's normal to feel that way. But God has not forgotten me. I I want you to say this out loud. Say, the Lord has not forgotten me. Say it. Say it, the Lord. The Lord hasn't forgotten me. Now, this is a powerful verse. John 14 and verse 16. Jesus says this before He goes to the Father. John 14, verse 16. I've chosen the contemporary English version. He says, then I will ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit. And, And then... This word, Holy Spirit, is paraclete in the Greek. So it could be translated as comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, even encourager. So put any one of those in there. Uh, Jesus says, I've asked the Father to send you the comforter, to send you the helper, to send you the counselor when you don't know what to do. Maybe you are a widow. How in the world am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to make it emotional? Counselor, how am I going to even make it comforter? Do you, do you know, listen, we love you. And I'm looking at some of you that have lost your spouses. We have no words in the natural. Nothing can, we, we, we can't come up with any kind of eloquent way to try to comfort you. So my complete reliance is on the Holy Spirit because the promise is this, is that the Holy Spirit will comfort you somehow beyond words that none of us can say. We'll hug you, we'll cry with you, but it's the Holy Spirit is going to comfort you. When you don't know how to pay your bills, when you don't know how you're going to make it emotionally, He's going to somehow counsel you, help you. When you're grieving with someone who's lost something, probably the best thing you can do is just cry. Don't say too much. Some of you that have been walking with the Lord for a long time, you talk too much. (laughs) Tell me you love me. There's not an easy answer. When someone loves the Lord with all their heart, they're faithful, they're obedient, and something bad still happens and they've experienced great loss, why don't you just cry with them? Instead of trying to pontificate and act like you know the answer, because you don't. But the Holy Spirit knows the answer, and He knows how to meet them right where they are in the depths of their despair. He'll comfort them, counsel them, help them. Your job is to release the love and the comfort of the Lord to this person. And so Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, He promises the comfort, the, the counselor. And so what we draw from is this, keep up your hope. If you've lost a person, a loved one, if you have lost something that's, that's just huge in your life, keep up your hope. Don't give up today. Keep up your hope. 
Receive the comfort of the Lord. Only He can do it. There might be bitterness, but God's going to change that bitterness into sweetness. Hebrews 13, verse 5, the Living Bible says it this way, For God has said, I will never, never fail you, nor forsake you. That's your verse. That's your verse when you're hurting. Lord, you said you'll never fail me. You'll never forsake me. Never, never fail me. That's your verse. The New Living Translation says it this way, For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. I don't know in the natural if I could make it if Sarah passed away. I cannot imagine. I don't want to live my life with anyone else. I say that in the natural. But I also have confidence in God that somehow he would comfort me and he'd fill the empty places in my heart and the empty spaces in my life that only Sarah could fill. Somehow he would do it because that's what the word says. So in the natural, I I don't think I can make it, but by the power of the Holy Spirit and God's grace, I know that I can make it. And this would be my verse. You'll never fail me, Lord. You'll never abandon me. Torn up by loneliness, emotional despair, but you said you would never abandon me. I'm going to hold on to that. That's my verse. The NIV says it this way. We have this, I'm sorry, Hebrews 6.19 in the NIV says this, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So keep up your hope. Let that be your anchor. The storm is raging. The emotions are all over the place. But you got an anchor, and it's called hope. And it's going to make you firm and secure. Can you say amen? So, so, so the second key is, is comfort, but you got to keep up your hope. And so realize that God has not forgotten you. And so Naomi and Ruth, they, they hold on to this. Now, the third principle is this. you got to cast your anxiety on the Lord. you got to cast your anxiety. I'm sure if you've been through loss or you're going through a difficult time, you're feeling anxiety. That's fear. Fear, like can you make it another day? Fear, how will... How will I provide? Fear, how am I going to make anxiety? Okay, But the key is providential care. You have to understand that God is going to take care of you and that he's going to protect you and provide for you. If you're a widow this morning, I'm sure that you have felt, you have wondered, how in the world am am I going to make it financially? This is your verse. God, God is going to provide for you. This is your principle. God is going to provide for you. And I'm sure you've felt vulnerable. But you know what? God will protect you. So listen to to Ruth chapter 2. We'll go to Ruth 2 and and verses uh, 11 to 12. So this is after uh, Ruth begins to glean in the harvest field. And, and, And it says, Boaz replied to her as he asked who she is. I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What did they do? They cast their cares on the Lord completely, to provide for them. Uh, Listen to Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. You say, I feel pretty shaken. That's your verse. Keep praying it till you start feeling this. See, what happens a lot of, here's what people do a lot of times. I do it. We start feeling shook up. God must have left me. I don't don't feel like the Lord is with me. We we all do that. But don't make a theological conclusion that God is gone. The issue is your humanity. So you start praying into this. You say, Lord, I feel real shaken, but you said you care for me and you will sustain me. And you said I'll never be shaken. So if I'm shook up right now, then there's something with my humanity 
So I'm going to pray till I get there where I feel that I'm sustained and I'm not shook up. Say amen. That's such good preaching. So you cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He'll never let the righteous be sick. You're righteous today because of Jesus. You're righteous today because you've received Christ. You're righteous. That's you. That promise is for you, so you won't be shaken. So that's your prayer. We understand the feelings, but you pray into this, and you say, that's, the, that's where I'm going. That's the direction that I'm moving in. 1 Peter 5, verse 7 says this, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. This, this sometimes is a process. It doesn't happen in one shot. And so you keep doing it over and over until you own it and it's actually happening in your life. You know, when it comes to grieving, uh, a couple of things that that, will help you. Uh, One is grieve. That was profound. (laughs) One is grieve. Because some people don't. They try to shut it off. Just go ahead and cry. But don't force it. Don't force the grieving. What you do is you keep taking one step at a time, and then when it hits you, you cry. But you keep taking one step at a time. And that's where some people miss it. They, they say in counseling that one of the best ways to deal with grief is, is to go about your routine. Go about everyday things. Just keep doing what you do. Go to the store, shop. Go, to the, uh, go through your routine. Go to work. And then when it hits you, you cry. And go ahead and cry through it, and then just keep walking and walking and, and walking. And so, so one is, is grieve, but continue in the process, because it doesn't always happen in one shot. And by the way, it happens differently for different people. Some people, it's really tough. Other people have a grace on them. Listen, if, you've, if, you're, if your husband you know, lived a, a long, rich, full life and loved the Lord, Uh, he's in heaven, he's in a better place. You miss him, but the comfort is you know you're going to see him. And it's not going to be long, hallelujah. That's supernatural, that's supernatural, right? And so you cast all your anxiety, even the fears, even the heartache, even the disappointment. Now, now I'm speaking in context here, but go ahead and plug it in and apply it to other areas. Uh, You lost your job. You lost a marriage, you lost a child, you lost whatever it might be. Cast that anxiety on him because he cares for you. And so, so, so the, the key is providential care. God is going to take care of you. He will. That's the promise. Say amen. And so he'll protect you. He'll provide for you. And so that, that's what happened to Ruth. Naomi said, hey, you keep doing it. And Boaz kept an eye on her. He said, protect her. She's at the back. She's, uh, that oftentimes might have been an unsafe place, but he says, you, you take care of her. You, you provide uh, for her. Now, the next one is this. Be open to new things. <clears throat> and the key is romance. So the, lo- the desire, let me say this, and, and then I'll, I'll explain it. The desire for love and romance is fulfilled by the Lord and in others. So this becomes a love story. It's amazing. Now, let's go to Ruth chapter 3, verses 8 to 9. I'm going to read it out of the CEV. In the middle of the night, Boaz suddenly woke up and was shocked to see a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. Sir, I'm Ruth, she answered, and And you're the relative who is supposed to take care of me, so spread the edge of your cover over me. Boaz replied, the Lord bless you. This shows how truly loyal you are to your family. And now we begin to see that there's a love story beginning here because he says, you could have looked for a younger man, either rich or poor, but you didn't. Don't worry, I'll do what you have asked. You are respected by everyone in town. He knew kinsman redeemer. He knew there was a whole lot more to the custom and culture. It's hard for us to read back into it, but he knew exactly uh, the nuances that were being being suggested. Uh, And and so there's this love story that that takes place. Now, I'm going to encourage you to be open to new things and understand 
the power of romance. Okay? Now realize this, the desire for love and romance is first of all fulfilled in the Lord. Then it's fulfilled in others. Don't miss part one. It's fulfilled in the Lord. Okay? You've got to find that fulfillment in the Lord. We often say in counseling this, that two, two halves don't make a whole. You've got to be whole. Otherwise, when you come into the relationship, if you're looking for the other person to just make you whole, you'll slip into codependency. Don't misunderstand. That's different than being complete. When you get married, you ought to feel complete. You ought to feel like, wow, she filled all those empty places in my life. She makes me feel complete. But, she, but Sarah's not the one who makes me whole. The Lord makes me whole. He makes me whole. And so if, 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 you're, if you're not whole, then you're going to start looking to people in an unhealthy way. And so that, that's really important. So, so your romance is fulfilled, first of all, in the Lord. God created you for romance. He created you for passion. God created you that way. That's the way he designed every single one of us. Why do you think the whole world right now is, is busy, busy, busy trying to be in relationships, trying to attract somebody? Because God made us that way. Okay? But do you know that, that romance is a reflection of the passion that deep down you have for God? That's what it should be, your passion for the Lord. So, ladies, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. You want an amazing lover? Find a man of God. I said find a man of God because he'll be passionate for the Lord, and then he'll be passionate for you. Say amen to that, church. So, so God created us for, for romance. He created us to first of all, love Him. Now, the Song of Solomon, I, I don't necessarily recommend that for your devotional reading all the time. <laughs> but the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, and it's confusing when you read it because there's all kinds of imagery and poetry that they can't really translate into the English vernacular. So it's confusing, but let me lift out one because it's clearly a romantic book, but there's two aspects to it. He's talking about love for the Lord, but he's also talking about love for your spouse. And listen to Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6, again, out of the contemporary English version. Always keep me in your heart and wear this bracelet to remember me by. The passion of love bursting into flame is more, power than the, more powerful than death, stronger than the grave. That's your love for the Lord and your love for your husband or your wife. Say amen to that. And, and so passion, passion for the Lord. The, the, if you're single today and you're not married, listen, take the passion and the drive that you have for romance and, and, and put it toward the Lord. And get focused on the Lord. And then one day God's going to tap you on the so shoulder and say, hey, look over here and look at this beautiful woman or look at this incredibly handsome guy. And then you'll turn and like, whoa, that's amazing, right? But you weren't discouraged and you weren't distracted and you weren't running around uh, to, like a chicken with your head cut off. No, you had clear purpose. And you said, I'm following the Lord. I'm passionate about the Lord. And then when he brings someone into your life, then you're passionate about her. You're passionate about him. Say amen to this. Amen. Okay. So, 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 so keep your, in your heart and wear this bracelet to remember. The passion of love bursting into flame. And more powerful than death. Should be. You should die for your wife, man. You willing to die for your wife, for your kids? That's a kind of intense passion. Passion for the Lord and the passion for your families. The intensity of that. Listen to Isaiah 43, 19. Now, I've said that, that the key is romance. The desire for love and romance is fulfilled in the Lord and others. But don't forget my point. Be open to new things. <clears throat> you, you know what, what keeps your romance alive is not just routine and spending time with each other, but, but new things. New things. 
When was the last time you went on a date? When was the last time you did something new together? Something creative together? So, so we know that in the natural when it comes to, to romance. You know what? When it comes to the Lord, it's the same thing. It's exciting. Lord, are you doing a new thing? I want you to know that a, a, a romance with the Lord is always exciting and new. It's passionate. You know why? Because... Because the Lord is never boring. He's exciting. And so you'll have feelings you never had. You have thoughts you never had. Just experiences with the Lord. I know some of you, this is hard. Hard for you to, 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 to receive. Because it might feel awkward. But you've got to love the Lord. You've got to love the Lord. Amen? Okay. Now, if you're single today, I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I could give you many illustrations about for example, a child and a parent. So there's many illustrations of love, but, but when it comes to, 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 to relationship with the Lord, there, there's passion in, in marriage. And, and so this desire of romance is fulfilled in the Lord. Now, now listen to Isaiah 43, verse 19. See, I'm doing a new thing. Say new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And so she, Ruth, was open to new things. <clears throat> now, I, I, I don't, everybody's different. I, I don't think I could ever marry someone else, honestly, if Sarah went to heaven. And I, I, res I respect that. And there's other people, and I have very close friends that marry a widow and beautiful fulfillment of, of God's purpose for them, Okay. Now, some of you have gone through the heartbreak of separation, of a divorce. And many people, after just a terrible divorce, have no desire to ever get married again. Understandable. I, I can understand that. Very understandable. Why would you open up your heart again? Why would you become vulnerable again? Now, here's the key. The key is, one, let the Lord heal you. That, that's the first thing. Let Him heal you. And then be open to whatever you say. The answer might be that you're never to get married again after a divorce. Never to get married again after a separation. Never to get married again after losing a spouse. That might be the answer. And, and the good news is the fulfillment will be in the Lord. He's going to fill those empty places in your heart. Okay, But the point is he's healed your heart. He's filled that. Okay, Now, once he's done that, just be open to new things you never know. You never know. So the woman has been abused. I can understand why she would never want to get married again. But once God heals her heart, I said once God heals her heart, I said once God heals her heart, once she's healed and whole, then just be open to new things. The new thing might be that you're single and very fulfilled in that the rest of your life. But the new thing might be that he introduces you to somebody and there might be a relationship there for you. But let the Lord heal your heart. Say amen to that. And then be open to new things. You're, you're open, say amen. You're open to the Lord doing something new in your romance with Him, but you're open to whatever the Lord has. Only you can answer that. Amen, church? Amen. Someone say destined to follow. Say destined to follow. To follow. Let me just give you the, the last one and I'll wrap this up. You got to trust God's sovereign plan. And the key is redemption. So the Lord will redeem what was lost in your life. I said the Lord will redeem what was lost in your life. And so Ruth and Naomi, they trusted uh, God's sovereign plan. Listen to Ruth chapter 4, and this is verses uh, 13 to 15. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And then he went to her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. Now, this is huge. Uh, somebody bought the land. There's provision. Now her daughter-in-law is married. Uh, everything is, is redeemed. Yes, there's loss, but, but there's, there's redemption. Uh, may he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is 
and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. So she's lost everything, but now there's restoration. Now, the word redeem, listen carefully, means to take back that which is lost or to buy back something that was stolen. And so God has redeemed all of us uh, in Christ. Listen to Colossians 1, 13 to 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, say redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so you have been redeemed, okay? You, 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 have, you, you were in slavery, but God set you free. You were in a slave to sin, but God, God bought you out of slavery and set you free to be a child of God. That's redemption. Okay? Uh, property that, uh, that, that, that was lost or stolen, God buys back, okay? Now listen to Isaiah 43, verse 1, NASB. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So so Ruth and Naomi understood. And what a picture of the kinsman redeemer, because we know theologically Jesus is the kinsman redeemer. Yeah, Jesus. Jesus comes and, and, and buys any property that was... That was, that was lost or needed to be bought back. He buys the property. He rescues our life. So that's redemption. Redemption. So you might be here today and, and might be a widow or a widower. You might, might have lost a, a relationship or something. A very, very precious to you. I'm here to declare to you. Nay, nay. I'm here to prophesy to you that God will redeem you. Hallelujah. He will redeem and take back that which was lost, that which was stolen. But you got to open up your heart and say, Lord, heal me. Heal me, change me. I'm open to do things. And, and Lord, that's the direction that I want to go. Are you willing to follow the Lord? Leave all behind, forsake all, abandon all for the call. Say, God, I'll, I'll follow you like Ruth did. Destined. To follow. You are destined to follow. Would you please say that out loud? Say, I'm destined, destined to follow. Amen? Let's stand to our feet.